So it turns out that Infinimus basically lost absolutely nothing with these nerfs, is still incredibly fast, efficient, durable, as well as being able to clear a density with the best of them. Oh, and it also still just absolutely melts bosses. I wasn't expecting this at all, but it's time to talk about Infinimist and why I think it's still an S tier build. Walking into Season 3, we saw a heinous, heinous nerf to the overall effectiveness of Corpse Explosion as a tool for the Infinimus build. Now, the reason why the build was so strong is because you're able to automate and easily apply a huge amount of Corpse Explosion effects to the ground simultaneously, which would do a decent amount of damage, very quickly net you a bunch of bonuses, like the Flesh Eater legendary node, Fueled by Death, as well as Blighted, and then trigger Shadow Blight a whole bunch, as well as X-Falls. And then when you add on Blight as an amazing utility tool, with just a single skill rank in it, you're able to effectively double the total output of the build. It's what took Infinimus from one of the best in only Nightmare Dungeon pushing builds back in Season 0 to a pretty decent boss killing build as well in Season 2, bumping it up somewhere around like C or B tier for boss killing, but S tier because of its ridiculous speed and damage output in every other type of content. But this change to the lucky hit chance of the skill, as well as vaguely nerfing the damage output from Blighted, had a lot of people, myself included, a little bit dire about the outcome of Infinimist as a viable build. Well, go ahead and just throw all those concerns away. This thing is shredding content. It is just as insanely tanky as it always has been. You are proccing X-Falls at an incredible rate, because it turns out you just toss on a little bit more crit chance, a little bit more damage, your Seneschal is going to help you out, and then you basically pilot the build as you always did. Now the one thing that I was afraid about, though, was its ability to be able to zerg down bombs. Bosses. So let's just go ahead and look at Echo of Lilith as like one of the only things with a good enough health pull to get an idea of how quickly you're able to output damage. And while we are not matching the ridiculous speed of Blight, what we do have on the build is enough mobility, utility, and freedom of aspects to actually be able to survive the second phase of this fight too, where now that you can't just zerg through all of her phases, you actually have to survive these fireballs. On top of the barrier that you generate, you can actually tank more than one of them, and then Ghost Walker along with Blood Mist and Blood Soaked actually get you the mobility that you need to just straight up outrun the things. Now, just like always, I'll be updating the Maxwell build guide with my findings in just a couple of days, probably over this weekend where I have a lot of work slated to update all my various guides. And then on top of that, I will have a build planner down below so you can just take a look at this bad thing. And it turns out we haven't really had to change anything about the character at all. And you might be very happy to notice we're literally using two unique items. Ring of Sacrilegious Soul, as well as X-Falls Ring, the kit and caboodle that's pretty typical for this thing. No uber uniques. None of them would even be good. No other uniques. You just don't need them. And where I thought that we were going to have to overcompensate with a huge amount of lucky hit chance, generally reducing the mobility and the utility that the different aspects could bring to your build, that's just unnecessary. The thing's cracked out of its gourd. So go ahead and use the timestamps down below. I promise you will not offend me. If you just want to jump around to the parts that you want, feel free to do so. And because I got such a great response from the last video in regards to it, I am going to be going over some of the drier parts with the gameplay so that you can keep your attention, give you something to be looking at. So while I'm droning on, I'm not wasting too much of your time and you're staying entertained. Thank you again so much to everybody who commented on my Blight Build Guide video. You were able to give me a huge amount of insight into what people like, what people enjoy. And basically, other than a few people who say that it's going to negatively impact their ability to hear that information more properly, and I totally understand that, you know, shout outs to the neurospiciness out there, it could be hard for us. What I would recommend is for any of those people to look at the D4 planner as opposed to listen to me drone through the skill section, because while there may be really interesting things in there that you would like to learn, I actually have long form content, which I can also link down below, that literally goes over every single nuance of the Infinimus Necromancer, if that's what you're trying to learn. So hopefully we're able to make everybody happy, but to the people who are negatively impacted, I truly do apologize, but it looks like the vast majority of people like it that way. Let's go ahead and start with the gear and the aspect so you can get a better idea of what we're looking at here and just so that you understand why we're making the decisions in the skill tree that we are. For the helmet, lucky hit chance with barrier is the most important stat that we can put on there. The more that we can buoy up our lucky hit chance across all of our different procs, the better that we're able to alleviate the negative impacts of the nerves and be able to propel our damage as potentially high as possible. 
Then on top of that, total armor, which you don't need if you're using Juggernaut, I'll talk about that in a second, but maximum life and cooldown reduction are a must. Here's where we're gonna be putting of the void so that we can actually pull monsters in with blight so we can stack everybody in one area more effectively. For the armor, you're gonna see a lot of this out of me this season, but I'm basically trying to stack in more damage everywhere. So darkness skill damage as well as intelligence. And then for stats here, because I am using Juggernaut, I'm going for maximum life and damage reduction from close. What I would really recommend for most people running this is to actually use damage reduction from shadow targets over the darkness skill damage. The intelligence is percentage increase in our damage. The darkness skill damage is just a little bit of additive on top, but I was messing around with how much total damage I could get out of this build to make sure that we're able to basically one shot packs with our X-Fall procs whenever possible. Then here's where you're gonna put on Shielding Storm for the ridiculous survivability that that aspect brings to the build. For the stats, we want attack speed, critical strike chance, and lucky hit chance. You could actually reroll the shadow damage over time into more intelligence or all stats if you need that for your Paragon board. The shadow damage over time is going to scale our shadow blight damage Damage. So while we don't actually care about our shadow damage over time at all, we do like the fact that scaling one of our credible sources as our own kind of offshoot version of crit damage over time, which is what Shadow Blight is for us. Then you'll notice that we have Blighted on our gloves. You might be like, Mac, that's crazy. What is that doing on your gloves when you have a perfectly open amulet up there? Remember that we are a full crit build on Infinimist. There's no more pretending like it sits in this weird middle ground. While you're gonna level with Corpse Explosion damage, in the end game, you are a crit build. And that means we need grasping veins to bring us all the way up to that 100% chance to crit when we stack on all the different effects from our gear as well as our Seneschal. For the pants, I basically drop all of my survivability stats here to make sure that I hit all the requirements that I have. But total armor, maximum life, damage reduction, damage reduction, and then this is where I'm putting Juggernaut. You'll notice that I have severely overcapped armor. I could take 4,000 armor off here and still be over cap. So what that basically means is again, you do not need these total armor rolls anywhere to be able to reach this amount. So you could instead go with ranks to blood mist to make sure that that's coming off of cooldown as fast as possible. Ranks to corpse explosion if you're still doing some kind of hybrid here. But more importantly, you could also put intelligence or all stats. For the boots, max evade charges as well as movement speed. Intelligence, I like essence cost reduction so that we can spam blight without having to have any real essence generators on the build itself. And then a single resistance. If you're not using Ring of Starless guys, you need a single res on the rest, on the rest of your pieces of gear so that you can actually hit that cap. So this is where we're going to put it. If you don't go with the essence cost reduction, you can also go with ranks to corpse tendrils. And then this is where we're putting ghost walker. So that not only are we gaining that 25% movement speed while we're in blood mist, but for four seconds after. Similarly, if you're not doing nightmare dungeon 100s or vault 100s and you're instead farming in the overworld, you can actually throw on Tibalt's here for even more damage. And also against Echo of Lilith or Echo of Malphus, you could also put on Tibalt's here for a huge 40% damage multiplier that you have up all the time because we are infinimist after all. The amulet movement speed cooldown reduction and then gloom ranks are all required you can go with more lucky hit chance here you could go with damage reduction here you could go with darkness skill damage but i definitely think that those three core stats are the most important and then here again is where we're putting grasping veins the 30 percent crit chance here along with our seneschal and then our base crit chance in our actual stats here basically means that along with our sacrifice of skeletons we're at 100 percent chance to crit as long as corpse tendrils has been cast recently and 100 percent chance to crit is just so wildly important to make sure that we're always outputting as much damage as possible ring of the sacrilegious soul you'll notice that i don't have a perfect roll here i finally got a one second cool down for the corpse explosion which you definitely feel on this build i was running a 1.6 and basically felt like i was moving through molasses and while it was still functional at least you need to have this one second cooldown on the corpse explosions and then maximum lucky hit chance as the next priority maximum life as the third priority and then if you have max corpse skills that's cool it's really only there to reduce the cooldown of corpse tendrils since we don't care about corpse explosions damage itself and then for x falls ring in order of importance you need the maximum damage on the actual effect itself since that's your base damage that then gets scaled by all the rest of your various multipliers and then we care about the cooldown reduction and then the lucky hit chance. Cooldown reduction has become incredibly important since we are just less good at proccing Abhorrent Decrepify, but as long as those three stats are near max, you're gonna have a good time. Then the all stats, then the damage over time. For our wand, intelligence, all stats, and you can go with vulnerable, damage to close, damage to shadow targets, or just straight up crit damage if you're actually at 100% chance to crit. And then this is where we're obviously putting ultimate shadow. You need ultimate shadow on the build somewhere. In fact, I basically think you should almost be running ultimate shadow on any build that can fit it, because not only 
does it you know just naturally synergize with shadow blight blighted all of our shadow damage etc but the damage over time effect that it applies to a target counts as shielding storm bone storm hitting an enemy so you're like nearly quadrupling your barrier generation by having this aspect on your build. Don't sleep on using this on things that don't really care about darkness damage. And then for the offhand, you can be using a lidless wall. What that basically means is that you have to drop blood soaked and blood soaked is how we're able to proc X walls a huge amount of additional times, get stacking shadow damage up, and then turn this build into the ridiculously fast moving build that you were seeing in the gameplay. Please, please, please do not ignore blood soaked aspect here but we're obviously going for a focus for that cooldown reduction. And then for stats, we want lucky hit chance, lucky hit chance with barrier, cooldown reduction. And then while I have essence cost reduction here, I would actually like critical strike chance because if I had that, I could swap over one of our book of the dead since I would still be reaching basically 100% chance to crit. But essence cost reduction is always a great option, again, for being able to minimize how often we need to cast corpse explosion itself to get our resources back up from spamming blight. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about the skill tree. And again, please enjoy the gameplay here but i'll try to go quickly just so people who are looking for more information will get what they need and we can move on to the rest of the build we don't use any of our basic skills so don't worry about getting a third point in here we're only using blight to be able to trigger its ability to add on a 15 percent damage multiplier we don't care about scaling its damage at all and then obviously three points into huge flesh since that's basically the engine of our build You'll notice that I'm maxing out Blood Mist. I don't necessarily believe that you actually have to do this in the end game, but you have the extra points to toss around and there's not really a better place to put them. You could put them into Corpse Explosion, just be able to ramp up its damage a little bit. And I don't think that that would necessarily be wrong, but it's not a priority of ours. Three points into Grim Harvest is incredibly important so that the Ring of Sacrilegious Soul is basically handling all of our essence generation that we need to be able to spam Blight. Then obviously Fueled by Death to be able to get that additional damage boost. And then again, only one point into Corpse Explosion along with Blight corpse explosion for the other part of our engine. You notice I'm still putting the cheeky point into spiked armor. Yes, thorns from spiked armor will allow you to trigger Abhorrent to Crepify when you're using Bone Storm and running through monsters. So it's basically just a free way of getting additional procs, and I definitely think it's worth the single point in the skill tree, even if all it ever does is shave a few seconds off of some of your skills every run. Abhorrent to Crepify to be able to do everything that this skill does, along with Amplify Damage as a huge multiplier, and then Death's Embrace as a great damage reduction tool, as well as a little bit of a damage boost. Just one point into Corpse Tendrils, the additional ranks either on your boots and most definitely from Sacrilegious Soul basically brings the cooldown of this all the way down to a point where you never really need to manually cast it unless it's a single target so we don't care about maxing this out and then obviously the ability to apply vulnerable with it here in the shadow passives we do want to max out reaper's pursuit since we want to be super speedy while we're doing stuff maxing out everything else and then i do have two points into crippling darkness most notably for bosses it is just an additional tool for you to be able to apply stagger i don't think that that's absolutely useless we're trying to automate as much of this build as possible. So being able to apply crowd control without necessarily having to do anything extra on our part obviously goes a pretty decent long way. And then pretty standard, maxing out standalone, maxing out Memento Mori, and then Bone Storm down here into Shadow Blight. And then obviously the sacrifices in the Book of the Dead are going to look a little bit interesting here, and it does depend on your actual gear. But I do currently need the critical strike chance to be able to reach 100%. If you get there with stats on your offhand, or if you just have an insane amount of decks for some reason, you would absolutely be sacrificing Reapers for that 15% damage multiplier but just keep this in mind the footage that you were just watching is missing an entire 15 percent damage increase that it could get if my stats were a little bit more optimal obviously sacrificing cold mages for the 15 percent vulnerability boost and then iron golem for the 30 percent critical strike damage boost the paragon board that you see right here is what i currently put together first respecking into this build there's almost certainly going to be optimizations that can be had and the planner itself will be perfect what you're seeing right here is just what I kind of did in the spur of the moment. I have not optimized it. It's obviously very good. You saw the outcome from it, but I just want to hammer that on. I continue to get comments saying like, hey, why is this different? And it's just because me, Mac, is a human being. The planner is a mortal. Sacrificial in the main board for everything that that does for us. Yes, sacrificial works when you have a Seneschal. I've tested it. Up here into the Wither board, you'll notice that we're not actually picking up the Wither Legendary node. We're picking up a good amount of everything. We're not picking up damage over time here, but this is where we're putting Abyssal to be able to get that additional 1.1 multiplier and a little bit of additional additive shadow damage. Building into Scent of Death, 
damage to healthy to get them down into essence range so we can get that 1.22 multiplier additional crit damage over here then this is where we're picking up a minimum investment for exploit because we're really just looking for the additional 1.1 multiplier and the additive damage is kind of meh it's fine building into flesh eater board this is where we're going to be putting darkness as the biggest total intelligence investment here just as a huge flat damage bonus that helps us then we're building over into the flesh eater node and then i am picking up stifle for the additional critical strike damage and the damage to injured isn't bad for being able to close out a fight a little bit more quickly building up into bone graph this is we're actually putting a minimum investment for scourge again the shadow damage over time doesn't really help us but it does go further to be able to scale our shadow blight procs but this is where we're getting a 1.1 damage multiplier which is really important and then over here in bloodbath hitting a full investment on essence for the additional crit damage in that 1.22 multiplier then for a seneschal i'm still playing around with bushwhack i can't quite tell if bushwhack or tempest is better they kind of seem to be the same, but the cool part about Bushwhack is it does allow it to very quickly apply a bunch of damage effects to a single target, which is something that Tempest can't do. So I'm not full throat endorsing it, but I do think that has a really good use case. Then we're going with Arcing, so it'll trigger a bunch of times. Dusk, so they can very quickly speed up our ability to stack Shadow Blight procs. And then Breaking to have a permanent uptime on Vulnerable as well as being able to break barriers just in case you run into the butcher out there. Flash of Adrenaline, because it says 20% damage boost, along with tactical in duration to be able to increase its duration and its cooldown, and then safeguard for the damage reduction that that offers when we have this up basically 100% of the time. I was really surprised by the output from the build. I quite literally thought that there was like a non-0% chance that Infinimus was going to fall into this weird obscurity where it was technically a thing that you could do, but just wasn't strictly better than anything else. But its raw strength and its ability to output the damage that it does at the speed that it does absolutely wins it a spot back in the upper echelon of Necromancer builds this season. So as my message to the developers, you tried to kill my little boy here, you couldn't get away with it. I'll see you next season when you inevitably nerf it again but until then if you were really hoping to be able to play the infinimus necromancer here you go it works great i hope that you have a great time this season with it if you are brand new here to the channel please go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you like what you're seeing i hope that the quality of the videos has been increasing to meet the demand of my audience and i hope that you guys are you know able to really dig your teeth in here and get everything that you need out of it but let me know down in the comments if you're a new subscriber or you're just joining in i'd love to say hi to you if you haven't been around here for a long time i basically try to answer every single comment that i can and while it's definitely not good for my mental health, I do see that a lot of people can appreciate it. And I'm glad I'm able to answer questions. So let me know if you have any of those questions down there as well. Did you want me to go over anything else in particular? Are you hoping to see something else in this video? Are you hoping to see something in an upcoming video? Please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much to everybody already. If you could also leave a like on the video, that helps me out a ton. It helps YouTube algorithm to know that like, hey, this was good. And I hope that other nerds would see it. But that's enough shilling for myself. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. I truly hope that it helps. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.